This one has three parts to it. I've debated splitting them into separate posts, but I feel like they kind of build off each other. Granted, I have lots of strange experiences which I'm sure I'll share eventually, but these three flow together. I'll start at the beginning. My parents were older when they met. My mum was born in 1960, my dad in 1965, and they met at a New Year's Eve party in 1990, eventually marrying in 1992. They'd had a rough couple of years as my dad had moved out. This had happened twice, leaving my mum convinced she'd never have a family of her own. They worked it out and had my brother in late 1996. His birth wasn't smooth. He was born about three weeks late, and doctors had to rush in and perform an emergency C-section on him as his heart rate spiked drastically. My mum told me that all these sirens were going off, and about eight doctors rushed in. They said he was lucky to be alive, and they said it again later, when he'd gotten badly injured as a three-year-old. There was a period of several days when my parents were counselled about possibly losing him. He's fine now, but he's the kid who shouldn't be alive. There must have been someone watching over him. He cheated death twice, and my mum had had dreams of angels holding him. Then there was me. In December 1997, when my mum was about 30 weeks pregnant with me, she awoke one night to severe cramps and profuse bleeding. My dad rushed her to the hospital, where a doctor told her, this doesn't look good, and another said, you will likely lose the baby. She clutched my brother, praying for a miracle, but due to her age, doctors worried for me throughout the pregnancy. The next morning, though, I was fine. The bleeding had stopped and everything returned to normal, but they had no answers as to what went wrong. They were confused as to how I was even alive. These events prompted jokes that some higher power was guarding not only my brother, but me as well. I have permanent effects from that event. When I was two, they discovered I had brain damage, which they linked to that day in 1997. Which brings me to the first strange experience, now that I've laid that foundation for you. When I was five, I became really sick, and I'd missed over a week of school. I was constantly tired, throwing up and lethargic. My mum took me to several doctors who couldn't find any issues with me, yet they knew I was sick. I didn't look well and wasn't acting like myself. Give it a few weeks, she'll get better, my doctor told my mum. She took me home and was reading me a good night story, in an effort to cheer me up. She read me my favourite story and typically I'd giggle and get excited at certain points in it, but not this night. I was unresponsive and so weak that moving even my head made me feel awful. Mum finally gave up reading to me, looked at me and said, You really don't feel well. Would you like me to pray for you? I nodded. I was too young to understand religion, but I was aware enough to know it meant something to her. I appreciated her help, although I was neutral to prayer. I can't remember the exact prayer, but she said something along the lines of, Please God, put your hand on her and heal her. She's felt sick for so long. After the prayer, she kissed me goodnight and left. I saw her enter her room and close the door behind her. I was now alone. Not more than a minute later, I sat up. It was weird. Why did I sit up? It was as if someone was controlling me like a puppet. Also, I was so weak that the random energy to sit up got my attention. I looked around my room, confused as I could see no one. As I was pondering this, I felt this hand touch my shoulder. It was a gentle pat. It had pressure and felt warm. Also, I could feel the individual fingers. I could feel it for only a second, then it was gone again. Yet here's the crazy part. The second the hand touched me, I felt instantly healed. I had energy, an appetite, and didn't feel like puking. I was so excited I wanted to dance around my room. I was facing my bedroom door when I felt the hand again, which touched me from behind. The hand didn't scare me and I never once felt fear from it. I looked all around my room, but of course no one was there. I thought back to my mum's prayer. Was it God? I felt sure it was. 
Once again, someone was watching over me, protecting me. It stayed with me and I pondered it. I've never had anything like that happen since. Flash forward to two years later. I was in the second grade, and every Friday my granddad would pick my brother and I up from school and take us back to his house to spend the night. My brother and I would stay up late watching Cartoon Network, back when it was good, and order pizza. It was fantastic, some of the best times of my childhood. One particular Friday stands out though. It was the Friday my brother and I almost died. The afternoon started off normally. My granddad picked us up from school and we were headed to his house. My brother and I never wore seatbelts. We'd pretend to click them in. And this Friday it slipped my granddad's mind to remind us to wear them, or maybe he figured a seven and eight year old wouldn't need reminding. We were a mile from his home and pulled up at the four-way intersection. It was a red light, so we weren't moving. My brother and I were playing some game and were getting kind of rowdy in our play. And my granddad peered into his rear mirror and saw that we weren't wearing seatbelts. Please put your seatbelts on. You know how dangerous it is not to wear them, he said. I kind of sighed and tried arguing with him. Never once in my seven years had I had something bad happen, so why would now be any different? He held firm and I put the seatbelt on. I thought it was stupid. We'd be at the house in a few minutes. As we were about to enter his neighbourhood, not even thirty seconds after the seatbelt clicked into place, this giant white SUV ploughed into us. It happened so fast that none of us saw it coming. Our car spun out into the intersection, and we spun maybe three times before stopping. It made me dizzy. His engine was smoking, and the smoke was so heavy that we couldn't see out of the car windows. It was dark, dark. I couldn't even see my brother next to me. "'Are you all right?' Grandad asked. We both answered, yes. "'Hurry and get out the car. The engine is probably on fire. The car could burst into flames,' Grandad said. We scrambled out. I was in so much pain from the force of the car ploughing into us, as it caused me to fall forward.' The impact was so intense that the seatbelt cracked two of my ribs when it caught me. Better than death, right? For two months my chest hurt and my granddad was covered in blood and required stitches. It was awful. He had to ride in the ambulance. I was so scared that I was uncontrollably crying. My brother and I had to ride home in a cop car. The police officer was extremely kind to me and sat with me on the side of the road cuddling me and reassuring me that everything was fine. I was fine. Grandad was fine. She bought my brother and I ice cream for being brave and took us home. After the police were gone, and after my grandmother hammered my granddad for not making sure we wore seatbelts, he sat us down for a serious talk. He told us that this voice told him to check on us. The voice told him that something bad was about to happen, and that we weren't wearing seatbelts. He said if the voice had never talked to him, he would have never noticed that we weren't wearing them. As the paramedics were treating him, one of the police officers tried to make a joke about it. He said something like, Good thing the kids were wearing seatbelts. If they weren't, they would have died. And that stayed with my granddad until he died. We would have died. The wreck was that severe, and we were that small. Even at seven I was small for my age. I probably looked five or six, and his car was totaled. He said the voice was clear as day. He believed that our luck saved us, again. Further proof that we had some supernatural power guarding us and protecting us. We shouldn't be alive right now, and I think about it a lot. My father passed away back in July 2013. He was diagnosed with cirrhosis at age 54 due to his heavy drinking, especially when he was younger. The doctor told him he would only have a year to live if he continued to drink, and remembering one of my uncles had died from the same disease recently, he finally gave it up. This diagnosis was in 2015. Fast forward eight years and it's the 4th of July. 
We enjoyed our local park's fireworks show, and it was beautiful. I was fortunate enough to record the event, recording his voice and us having laughs together. After the show, however, he started feeling sick, so we went home. That same night we had to go to the ER, and it turned out that his liver was failing and couldn't process his daily toxins fast enough, and it had actually seeped through to his bloodstream, with the toxins building up in his brain. He became disorientated and aggressive. The doctor promptly gave us the terrible news, that not only was his liver failing, but so were both of his kidneys, and that's when he declared my dad would be dead in less than a week. Despite not wanting to accept this, we called all family members and close friends so they had a chance to visit my dad before he passed. He was happy to see everyone, but also confused. After a day in hospital, the doctor discharged him and put him in hospice care with an oxygen tank. The visits continued at our house for a day until my father suddenly fell into a coma. I whispered into his ear that I loved him, and I was proud that he'd beat his addiction to alcohol. After that, I never got to hear him again. He passed away two nights later, never recovering from his coma. And that's when unexplainable things started to happen. Now, we own an old stereo that would read hello on a digital screen every time it would turn on, and goodbye whenever it turned off. The night my father passed away, the old stereo kept saying goodbye. I must also mention that it was unplugged. Next to said stereo, we had a small pair of hands made of glass, which would also light up, but the battery had died a long time ago. When it did light up, it would flash colours rapidly, and when I tried to turn it off, the switch didn't want to budge. The next weird occurrence happened at an aunt's house. We were paying our respect to my dad's memory, and had pitched up tarps with a few rows of seats. Once everyone was leaving, I started to clean up when suddenly someone grabbed the neck of my jacket from the back and shook me violently. I gasped and looked around, thinking someone was messing with me. But no one was around. Just me picking up the chairs. The last occurrence happened on the way to his burial. I was in a limo with my visiting cousins, reminiscing about my father. Once we drove past the entrance of the cemetery, I suddenly felt a sharp jab on my side. I turned to face my side but realised no one was sitting in that direction. My cousin noticed my reaction and said, I saw a white hand on your shoulder but didn't want to spook you. I choose to believe my dad was trying to say his goodbyes since he wasn't able to in life. It's my first time posting here on Reddit, and I have an interesting story to tell. My family and I live in Brazil, in the city of Balem, and it's known for its supernatural activity. This story is from back in the 70s. My great-grandmother on my mother's side, who we will call Maria, was a very rich person. She lived in a mansion with her husband and children, and since the house was so big, she had a few people that worked in the house gardeners, a chef, and maids, etc. Among the workers, there was a woman who we will call Beth. Beth, according to my great-grandmother, was a really nice and pleasant person. She had a natural charm about her, so much so that a neighbour, who we will call Carlos, fell madly in love with her. As she fell for him as well, Carlos's mother found out about their relationship and severely disapproved of it. She was terribly bigoted and a racist to boot. As Carlos and Beth's relationship solidified more and more, and their engagement became official, Carlos's mother concocted a terrible plan, hell-bent on ending their relationship. She invited Beth over for tea, and both sat together and had a long conversation. It turned out that Carlos's mother had told a terrible lie to Beth. She told her that Carlos had been unfaithful and had never intended to marry her. This is what she relayed to my grandmother as soon as she saw her. And Beth, driven by intense grief and anguish at the perceived betrayal, put on her wedding gown, walked to the laundry area of my grandmother's house, which was a nice outdoor area, doused herself with kerosene, and lit a match to her dress. 
Safe to say no one knew what was happening until her blood-curdling screams started. And every single person in the house ran to help put the fire out and call 911, attempting to save Beth's life. They managed to put out the fire, but Beth's entire body was burned in the process. Pieces of fabric were melted to her skin due to the intense heat, and she was in unimaginable pain. The ambulance arrived as she blacked out, and my great-grandmother was in intense shock from seeing a friend do such a horrible thing to herself. She was not able to accompany Beth to the hospital, so she stayed at home, anxiously waiting for news on Beth's condition. Getting tired of staying by the phone, she excused herself to the bathroom to take a shower. As she was walking up the stairs, she started hearing blood-curdling screams, terrible, anguished screams, calling out her name. She described it as coming from nowhere and everywhere at the same time. My great-grandmother stood frozen in intense shock and fear, not knowing whether she should run or cower in the face of such horrific sounds. Once a few terrifying minutes went by, she started screaming for it to stop, whilst clutching her head in pain. But the screaming would not stop, not until she unexplainably screamed, Please, Beth, stop! As soon as those words came out of her mouth, it stopped. She remained frozen, sitting in abject terror on the stairs, until she heard her telephone ringing. She ran to the phone and picked it up. It was her husband, my great-grandfather, calling from the hospital. He was calling to regretfully tell my great-grandmother that Beth had just passed away from her injuries. My great-grandmother had a mental breakdown due to the stress of everything that had happened and had to move out of that house for a long time to try to heal herself from such terrible events. Fast forward a few decades later. It was 2003, and I was still a child. I was eight years old at the time, and my sister was six. My family was still living, and is to this day, in the same house that that terrible event happened. One day we were playing in our pool with my mother, and everything was fine until my little sister started staring at the doorway that leads to the laundry room. She was staring at it for a few minutes, until my mother noticed and grew concerned. She asked my sister what she was staring at intently, and my sister replied, At the bride. She is pretty, she is smiling at me. My mother turned white as chalk, and grabbed us both and ran toward another section of the house. Later on I asked her why she was acting so strangely and she told me the story that I just told you. It's been about seven or eight years now since this happened, but I still have no answers as to what it was. I came across this subreddit hoping that maybe someone could give me some insight. For a little backstory, Leading up to what happened, I lived in my parents' house at the time, and they have since moved to a different house. There were four bedrooms, with mine being in the corner of the house on the second floor, and right next to my bedroom was my brother's room. We will call him Danny for the purposes of this story. He would always leave his door open when he was not in his room. Now I've never been afraid of the dark, but something about that house would feel really off at night. Every single time at night, I mean literally every time I would walk past Danny's room, I would get this ominous feeling that would send chills up my spine, causing me to walk faster until I got to my room. It was like something was staring me down. I would get to my room, turn the lights on and shut the door. Still leading up to what happened, I remember walking up the stairs cautiously approaching Danny's room to pass it, and his lights were off. I tried to not even look into it when I was passing. But as I walked past, I had the regular feeling come over me once again. But this time it was different. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see someone, or something, standing in his room. I called Danny with a little anger in my voice, because I thought he was just trying to scare me. But when I looked over, the figure was gone. I quickly flipped the lights on and no one was in there. It seriously scared me to death so I frantically looked around the house to find my brother was downstairs the whole time, in a completely different part of the house. I told him what had happened and he didn't seem to be phased. Maybe he was just trying to be the older, braver brother, 
I'm not sure. Now I'm not sure if this is a key point that needs to be mentioned, but also at this time, myself and my best friend that lives next door had recently discovered a Ouija board that used to be my grandmother's. She said she used to play for fun with her friends when she was younger, so we would play it in our house and his from time to time, but this was before most of these happenings occurred. Fast forward a month or two after seeing the person or figure in Danny's room. I went to bed one night, just like any other, but I seemed to be in a very deep sleep, to the point where I didn't wake up or turn over the whole night until it happened. I woke up with my vision still being a little blurry from sleeping so long, and I looked down at the foot of my bed, and there it was. A tall, six foot five plus, dark black figure. I couldn't see its face, but I still had the image of seeing it etched into my mind to this day. I didn't panic, and I didn't say anything. I just turned over, as if going back to sleep. I tried to act like I hadn't seen it, and when I looked back up a few moments later, it was gone. That was the most serious encounter I've ever had, and I never saw it again. I will say, though, that we would hear footsteps above us on the second floor when everyone in the house was downstairs, and to this day I still don't know what it was. This happened to me one day a few weeks ago. I was walking along a notoriously haunted road. I had decided to go during the day to gauge how active it was for paranormal activity. I was also alone at this time, thinking the road was safe, but I did have a Facebook live stream going for a while so my friends could watch. The first thing I noticed was when I first stepped foot onto the road, it felt like I was walking into water. You know the feeling you get when you dive down into the water and you feel a slight pushback? At the time I thought nothing of it because I was so used to it at this point. My walk down was actually quite pleasant, and I felt very calm on most of my journey. When I came to the forested area of the road, I got this feeling of being claustrophobic. When I got to a path where a famous tree called the Hanging Tree was, things got a bit odd. I decided to take a rest at this spot because it was hot out and it was a nice and shaded area. I also took that time to answer some of the questions my friends were asking on Facebook. As I was doing this, I heard a loud thud in some bushes beside me, which made me jump and look down the path. The path, when I'd first arrived there, was empty, but now had a human figure crouched at the side of it, rocking back and forth gently. It looked like a young adult, wearing what looked like a dark t-shirt, dark denim pants, and they had black shoulder-length hair and dark skin. Concerned by this, I called out to them. Hello? No reaction. So I called out again. Hello? I was loud enough that I scared a bird out of the tree over top of the figure, but still had no reaction. So I decided I was going to leave and not ask any questions. After leaving I felt I was being watched until I got out of the wooded part of the road. Nearing the end of the road and walking fairly fast, I decided I'd take one last break before reaching the end. It'll be fine, I thought. I can try and finish answering any more questions on my Facebook feed and whatnot. Almost as soon as I'd started, I lost connection and the stream cut out. As I was trying to get a connection again, I sat down because the sun was now beating down on me at full force. As I was fiddling with my phone to try and get it to work, I heard a loud thud from behind me again, and some gravel hit my back. I looked back and saw a large rock only a foot away from me. It must have been thrown from the bushes, and it just barely missed me. I started to panic at this point. If that had hit me, I would have been out for the count. I quickly got back up, and my stream started to work again. I said my goodbyes and made it to the end and started to walk back. As I got back to the forested part of the area again though, it got worse. I started to notice on my right side that dark figures were darting through the trees, going the same way I was. They were tall, maybe six or seven feet, and wearing dark black robes. The weirdest and scariest part of it is, I could tell they were heads. 
I could tell that they had heads, but I couldn't see anything about them. I couldn't tell if they had features or not, almost a blur, but the rest of the figures were plain as day, so I started to run. Once I made it back to the pathway to the hanging tree, I was out of breath and had to sit. I noticed that whatever the things following me were had stopped, and just to be careful I had kept a close eye on the forest, and that's when I noticed the last thing. Looking deeper into the trees, I noticed a large log laying down, and noticed an object on it. At first my eyes were a bit blurred because I was exhausted, but as I continued to focus I started to notice more, so I called out again. Hello? This time I received a reply. The entity turned her head towards me, and I could now tell it was a little girl, with long, dark brown hair and wearing a brownish dress. Her hair was all over the place, and she had pale skin, but not ghost-like. In a soft and confused voice, she answered, Hello? Startled by this, I immediately jumped to my feet. Then I noticed something else. She was looking my way, but for some reason she couldn't see me. She was looking around trying to see who had called out to her, but she couldn't see anyone. She never got up from the log while doing this, so I called out to her again. Hello? If you can see me, say something. Instead of answering or running away, like I believe a normal kid would at this point, she continued to sit there and just looked for this mysterious person, who she can hear but not see. Now I know that she could see me, because it was a clearing between us for trees. No trees from me to her. There were trees on the left and right, but it almost seemed like where the tree had fallen, no tree would grow all the way to the road. I decided at that point I'd had enough fun for that day and just fast walked back to my car, got in and left. Out of all my experiences on the road, that was the most eventful and was the best part of the day. It proved to me that we weren't just freaking ourselves out at night, which I have constantly been told. It was day. I have full confidence that nothing was going to happen and I was safe, and the road proved me wrong once again. I have learned a few things going to this road. One, no matter where you are on the road, who you are and what time, you are not safe from its wrath. Two, if you show the road confidence, the road will tear it down and beat it out of you. And three, this road is definitely haunted. This story begins a day before the event. Myself and two other people, Josh and Samuel, went to a location in a nearby city that the locals call Hell. This place used to be an old paper mill until it got burnt down back in the 80s and 75 people lost their lives. Since then it has become the local hangout for teenagers and every single one of them that we have interviewed has had an experience there. The teens have done pretty much everything from using Ouija boards to holding satanic rituals in this building. We only spent an hour in there because of how dangerous it is. What with it being a burnt down building and all. And the entire time we were there we felt as if something wanted us out and would get aggressive if we stayed too long. We really didn't want that though, because if we had been pushed we could have easily fallen through the various holes in the floor, the smallest of which is what I estimate to be a hundred foot drop. I did take some pictures one of which appears to be a face, but unfortunately I don't have the means to upload it to Imgur. I will post it if I figure it out though. The following day, which was a Monday, me and a few friends of mine, and my girlfriend, were hanging out and playing video games when my friend Thomas gave me a call. He told me he'd been to the notoriously haunted road where the hanging tree is, and he and his friends were being attacked by something. I drove over there with my girlfriend immediately, and found them all in a church parking lot, not too far away from the road. Thomas was the only one coherent. Two of them were writhing on the ground, we'll call them Haley and JJ, and one was unconscious, we'll call her Abby. There was a fourth friend there, who we'll call Richard, but he was freaking out too much to make any sense. 
JJ was screaming, saying he was scratched, which I checked out, and sure enough he had several scratches along his torso. Haley was saying something was hitting her, and after we were able to calm everyone down and wake Abby up, we all went back to the road. Haley was saying there was a little girl with her, holding her hand, telling her she had to kill JJ, Abby's brand new boyfriend. JJ kept on seeing a large shadow figure circling the group. Quick side note. Abby has been seeing a ghost which has apparently been following her since she was born. But Abby explained that the little girl holding Haley's hand was actually a demon. This put me totally on edge, to the point where I immediately started to do a minor exorcism. I'm not a priest, nor am I someone who actually is trained to do exorcisms, but I still tried to help, regardless. While I was performing the exorcism, Haley was seeming confused, as if not knowing what was going on. Then JJ, who had been quiet the entire time and not wanting to help out, started to laugh and mock us, but it wasn't in his normal voice. It was deeper, and almost sounded like there were two voices speaking at once. It was then I realised that the demon that Abby was saying was there was actually possessing JJ and not Haley. We ended up calling Haley's dad, who was a priest, asking him to come help us, which he did immediately. While we waited for about ten minutes, we had to constantly fight JJ to keep him from running into the forest. He ended up flailing and kicking my girlfriend pretty hard, punching Thomas in the face and spat in my face and headbutted me. When the priest arrived, he immediately started the exorcism while Thomas, Richard, Abby and my girlfriend and I held him down. The entire time he was screaming obscenities and flailing around. He ended up hitting me in the chest a couple of times during it. When everything was finished, we got back to the vehicles to rest before we all left. While resting, I ended up talking to JJ and finding out he'd been to hell literally just hours before I had gotten there, and also the previous day. I had taken out the picture I mentioned earlier and showed him, and he immediately recognised the face in the picture, saying that while he was in hell, something with that face charged at him. I advised him that he should go to a church every so often to keep himself safe and make sure that everything was gone. I gave him my number in case anything else happened and told him he needed to stay away from places like hell due to his private past. After that we all left. I kept in touch with JJ for a few weeks after and he seemed fine, but then I lost contact with him. I hope he's still doing okay and following my advice. This is my third post from the same road that has the hanging tree, and this time it involves my experience with the black-eyed children and the events leading up to that encounter. To start things off, I should mention that this was the third time that I had actually gone to the road, and I had read several accounts of a little girl being seen on there. This piqued my curiosity, due to doing some research on black-eyed children. I found out that they prefer rural areas, which this road definitely is. So me and two of my fellow investigators, Josh and Samuel, went off to said road. This was Samuel's first time going there, and at this point the only really big event that happened to us was just the week before, when we'd gotten a voice come through over the spirit box which was very clear. It was someone yelling answers to our question. Is there anything there? We were really excited about this so we did a little research on the road to figure out what else might be out there and this is when we found out about the KKK activity and the witchcraft and satanic rituals being performed there. So once all three of us had gotten there, we parked up and started heading down the road. At this point we had never made it to the end of the road, as usually we'd only make it part way to the forest area and would leave. This time we made it into the forested part of the road, and then decided to turn around. So far that night, the only weird thing that we couldn't explain was when Samuel had seen what he thought was a shadow figure following us from the woods, but neither Josh nor I saw it, so we decided to go back to the cars, because Samuel was starting to freak out a little bit. We got to the area of the road that we like to call the Spirit Box Hotspot. It's right near the beginning of the road, 
and it's where we get our best spirit box sessions. I had asked if they would be okay if we did a spirit box session there, because that is where we had gotten the clear voice the last time. They said yes, so I booted it up. I don't know what led me to asking the following question, but I did. It was, does anyone on this road know of the entities called black-eyed children? We got an answer almost immediately. The answer was a simple one word, that I would have just ignored if it wasn't so clear. And that answer was yes, in a young adult male voice, that at this point we had never heard previously. We all looked at each other, with excitement and concern. I went on to ask another question. Are there any black-eyed children on or near the road? Again immediately we got an answer. It was another yes, and it came from the same young adult male voice, so we know it was an interference. The fact that it was immediately after I had asked the question made it obvious. At this point Josh and Samuel were starting to freak out, but I was strangely calm for some reason. As they were telling me that we needed to finish up what we were doing and head back to the cars, I asked my third and final question. Are there any black-eyed children around us right now? Another yes. After hearing that final answer, suddenly from the trees behind us, where there is no civilization, we heard children laughing. We quickly ended the spirit box session and booked it back to the cars. When we got there, we noticed that Josh's and my car were fogged up from the inside. The scariest thing of all was what was on Josh's rear windshield. It was a handprint. The handprint was larger than any of ours, and there was no one else around for miles. We had kept a careful eye to see if anybody had driven on the road or had started walking there. It also looked like that whoever left the print had claws. Next we see on my rear windshield was the word leave written on it. At this point all three of us were freaking out. I was trying to come up with a logical explanation on why we heard children laughing and why the windows had been written on as we were trying to calm each other down and figure things out. Then we heard a child's voice from the woods in front of where our cars were parked, call aloud, hello. This froze us in our tracks. As we were trying to find the source of the hello, we started to notice little figures darting between the trees. I don't know what drove us to do what we did next, and I know it was stupid, but instead of getting into our cars and driving away, we ran back onto the road. We didn't get too far onto it though, as we heard something hit against one of our cars. It sounded as if something had jumped onto the roof of it. Without thinking we ran back to where they were parked, and when we got there we saw nothing, no damage whatsoever. Everything had just seemed to have stopped. This time we were smart, and we got back into our cars and drove off as fast as we could.